what were your interests as a kid? What, did you have jobs when you were at school? What were you doing to keep yourself out of trouble? I would say I had good prep for global payments when I was young because I was always a little bit of a tech geek. But actually, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. Um, so my dad uh, was and is still a physician in New Jersey. So what really got me on the business track, other than the tech stuff, was uh, my senior year um, in high school, I worked at the local hospital as an intern and a volunteer. And I actually had signed up for a bunch of pre-med courses when I was gonna go to Philadelphia for school. Uh, but that summer, um, I saw a lot of really great things, but I also saw, not surprisingly, in a hospital, a lot of people who were ill. Right. And uh, I just decided that um, I'm much better attuned to dealing with the business world than I am with all the emotional um, uh, elements that come with really treating uh, people who are you know, in, um, uh, in a lot of need of medical care. And I got to uh, Wharton right. uh, that first uh, semester as a freshman, changed all my classes from biochemistry or whatever it was back to finance and accounting, and I, I really haven't uh, looked back since. You, you were finishing up at Wharton, and then you go on to NYU for law school. Mm -hmm. Was the thought, I'm gonna be a lawyer? Or was your thought that I'm always interested in the business side of things? Yeah, I really wanted to be a lawyer at the time. So if I back up for a second, I, I really liked uh, school. Uh, I always knew I wanted to go to graduate school. Right. Uh, back then, I did think I wanted to be a lawyer, but I knew it was gonna be a corporate lawyer, right, as, as um, compared to litigation or something mm -hmm. else. So I knew I wanted to be in the business end of things. And I worked at a terrific law firm in New York um, when I started working after, uh, after graduation. But very quickly, I realized I really missed some of the things I had learned in business school, like strategy, uh, the mathematical nature of what I was doing. So within a couple of years of doing that, I moved over to investment banking at what now is Citigroup. So you move over to Goldman Sachs at one point, mm -hmm. uh, and you're the person who launched their financial payments group. Mm -hmm. uh, this is back in a time when people probably didn't understand payments at all. Um, did you have to sell that in at all internally, or was it just a natural outgrowth of what they were doing within their financial institutions practice? How did that all come about? So when I started it, it was really just credit cards. Back to your point, so go back to the 90s, Visa was a private company, MasterCard was a private company, PayPal really didn't exist, there was no Square, right, just go back through all those things. So really it was a focus on credit cards, and mainly on the issuing, meaning the banking side of credit cards, right. rather than on what we do, which is the acceptance side of uh, credit cards. So I would just say I kind of lucked into it. You know, when I was a lawyer, I had done a lot of financial services related deals, especially M&A. Mm -hmm. So I was very familiar with banking and how banking worked. Credit cards, of course, are an adjunct of banking and lending. It just so happened Goldman had come to the conclusion in the mid-90s that financial technology, really payments, was going to be a hot area. The two of them happened kind of at the right time, and it's you know really been a great experience ever since. Tell me about that, that vectoring point for you. You've made that decision to leave investment banking to go onto the corporate side. How did you come to that decision? So I knew payments was a really good uh, industry, and then the, the knowledge of the board and the management team mm -hmm. over a very long period of time, culture is really important to any business, but it's especially important to how I think about what we do. And I really felt like I had a firm handle on what the culture of global payments was. I was also looking at the same time to really expand my skill set. So when I was at Goldman in financial institutions, I was one of like eight partners, mm -hmm. probably managing a business with a couple hundred people in it. Right. And I looked at global payments at the time, and today, believe it or not, we're like 11,000 people. Um, but back then, we were probably 3,000 people. And I felt like it was a skill set I could develop going from managing 200 people and being one of eight people to do that to being somebody who was managing 3,000 people. And I wanted to see if I could do it. I wanted to see if I could especially do it in a technology environment. Give me the elevator pitch about global payments. What do you do? So we're the largest provider of payment technology, software, and services in the world, period. Um, that's the simple pitch. The more complicated pitch is we enable merchants anywhere in the world to take any type of payment on any type of uh, device at any time. Right. So a uh, very good way to think about that is uh, Apple Pay, going back to what I said before, didn't exist you know, five, 10 years ago. Uh, but when you wave your phone um, at the point of sale, when you go online and pay with your face, uh, when you order food on your phone, pay with your thumb and go pick it up, all that stuff is really us. Uh, you're in places around the world that people wouldn't think would necessarily be the biggest growth engines in your business. The Philippines, Czech Republic, Romania, these are markets that we in Atlanta may not think about as being great growth engines. What makes those foreign markets so attractive to a company like yours? So the most important thing in our business is to chase the consumer and really to chase GDP growth. And the one thing those markets you just described have in common from a demographic point of view is they have rising middle classes, they're underpenetrated by financial services, especially card. The markets grow faster than the rate of growth in our mature markets, and they're very much inclined to leapfrog on technologies. That kind of demographic trend, that rising middle class, that card adoption is all very good news uh, for our business. How many employees here in Atlanta proper? About 1,000. About 1,000 employees here. Um, how do you recruit your folks, and how do you think Atlanta stacks up as a place to recruit talent? Well, the most important thing in our business is culture. Um, we talk all the time about the health of our 
employee population, how we treat our people. I think it helps that the financial and operating performance have been very good. It's very easy to recruit people to Atlanta from outside Atlanta, especially in tech land. This mm -hmm. is some place they want to come, they want to work. I did it. You know, I moved from New York and New Jersey to here. So we emphasize employees, employee health, employee mobility, community service. We've had good performance. And as a result, I think people really want to stay and grow with us. And with mobile payments becoming such a big part of everything we do every day, I assume that global payments is facing more and more stiff competition every day. What are you seeing out there in terms of the competitive landscape? It's really the skill set, David. So the ability to attract the right type of technology people to present the right kind of user experience, user interface is critical in what we do. We do a lot of deals. Part of the reason we do a lot of deals is to add products, geographies, employee talent that we might otherwise not have it if we didn't do those things. So uh, there's no doubt it's a competitive business and I'm sure it'll stay that way, but our job is to out-innovate, um, out-invest the next guy and I think we've been very good at doing that.